The third account of Glam's hauntings was told to me as long ago as summer of 1893. I was travelling by rail from Perth to Glasgow, and the only other occupant of my compartment was an elderly gentleman who, from his general air and appearance, might have been a dominee or member of some other learned profession. I can see him in my mind's eye now, a tall thin man with a premature stoop. He had white hair, which was brushed forward on either side of his head in such a manner as suggesting a wig, bushy eyebrows, dark piercing eyes and a stern, though somewhat sad, mouth. His features were fine and scholarly. He was clean shaven. There was something about him, something that marked him from the general horde, something that attracted me and I began chatting with him soon after we left Perth. In the course of a conversation, that was at all events interesting to me. I had widely managed to introduce the subject of ghosts, then as ever uppermost in my thoughts. Well, he said, I can tell you something rather extraordinary that my mother used to say happened to a friend of hers at Glam's. I have no doubt you are well acquainted with the hackneyed stories in connection with the hauntings at the castle. For example, Errol Beardy playing cards with the devil and the weeping woman without hands or tongue. You can read about them in scores of books and magazines. But what befell my mother's friend, whom I shall call Mrs. Gibbons, for I have forgotten her proper name, was apparently of a novel nature. The affair happened shortly after Mrs. Gibbons died, and I always thought that what took place might have been in some way connected with her death. She had driven over to the castle one day, during the absence of the owner, to see her cousin, who was in the employ of the Earl and Countess. Never having been at Glam's before, but having heard so much about it, Mrs. Gibbons was not only a little curious to see that part of the building called the Square Tower that bore the reputation of being haunted. Tactfully bidding an opportunity, she sounded her relative on the subject and was laughingly informed that she might go anywhere about the place she pleased, saving one spot, namely Bluebeard's Chamber. There, she could certainly never succeed in poking her nose, as its locality was known only to three people, all of whom were pledged never to reveal it. At the commencement of her tour of inspection, Mrs Gibbons was disappointed. She was disappointed in the tower. She had expected to see a gaunt, grim place crumbling to pieces with age, full of blood-curdling spiral staircases and deep, dark dungeons. Whereas everything was the reverse. The walls were in an excellent state of preservation, absolutely intact. The rooms bright and cheerful and equipped with the most modern style. There were no dungeons, at least none in view, and the passages and staircases were suggestive of nothing more alarming than bats. She was accompanied for some time by a relative, but on the latter being called away, Mrs Gibbons continued her rambles alone. She had explored the lower premises and was leisurely examining a handsomely furnished apartment on the top floor when, in crossing from one side of the room to the other, she ran into something. She looked down. Nothing was to be seen. Amazed beyond description, she thrust out her hands and they alighted on an object which she had little difficulty in identifying. It was an enormous cask or barrel lying in a horizontal position. She bent down close to where she had felt it, but could see nothing. Nothing but the well-polished boards of the floor. To make sure again the barrel was there, she gave a little kick and drew back her foot with a cry of pain. She was not afraid. The sunshine in the room forbade her, only exacerbated. She was certain a barrel was there, that it was objective, and she was angry with herself for not seeing it. She wondered if she was going blind, but the fact that the other objects of the room were plainly visible to her discountenanced such an idea. For some minutes she poked and jabbed at the thing, and then seized with a sudden and uncontrollable panic, she turned round and fled. And as she tore out of the room along the passage down the seemingly interminable flight of stairs,
She heard the barrel behind her in close pursuit. Bump. 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 At the foot of the staircase, Mrs Gibbons met her cousin, and as she clutched the latter for support, the barrel shot past her, still continuing its descent. Bump. Bump. Bump though the stairs, as far as she could see, had ended, till the sounds gradually dwindled away in the far distance. Whilst the manifestations lasted, neither Mrs Gibbons nor her cousin spoke, but the latter, as soon as the sounds had ceased, dragged Mrs Gibbons away, and in a shaking voice, shaking in terror, cried, Quick! Quick! Don't for heaven's sake look around! Worse has yet to come! and pulling Mrs Gibbons along in breathless haste, she unceremoniously hustled her out of the tower. There was no barrel, Mrs Gibbons' cousin subsequently remarked by way of explanation. I saw it. I have seen it before. Don't ask me to describe it. I dare not. I dare not even think of it. Whenever it appears a certain thing happens shortly afterwards, don't, on any account, don't say a word about it to anyone here. And Mrs Gibbons, my mother told me, came away from Glam's a thousand times more curious than when she went. The last story I have to relate is one I heard many years ago, when I was staying near Balmoral. A gentleman named Vance, with strong antiquarian tastes, was staying at an inn near the Strathmore estate, and roaming abroad one afternoon in a fit of absent-mindedness entered the castle grounds. It so happened, fortunately for him, that the family were away, and he encountered no one more formidable than a man he took to be a gardener, an uncouth-looking fellow with a huge head covered with a mass of red hair, hawk-like features and high cheekbones, high even for a Scot, struck with the appearance of an Struck with the appearance of the individual, Mr. Vance spoke, and finding him wonderfully civil, asked whether, by any chance, he had ever come across any fossils when digging in the gardens. I didn't ken the meaning of fossils, the man replied. What are they? Mr. Vance explained, and a look of cunning gradually pervaded the fellow's featured. No, he said, I've never found any of those things. But if you give me your word and say nothing about it, I'll show you something I once dug up over yonder by the square tower. Do you mean the haunted tower? The tower that is supposed to contain the secret room, Mr Vance exclaimed. An extraordinary expression, an expression such as Mr Vance found it impossible to analyse, came to the man's eyes. Yes, that's it, he nodded. What people call, and rightly call, the haunted tower. I got it from there, but don't you say not about it? Mr Vance, whose curiosity was roused, promised, and the man politely requesting him to follow, led the way to the cottage that stood nearby and the heart of a gloomy wood. To Mr Vance's astonishment, the treasure proved to be the skeleton of a hand, a hand with abnormally large knuckles, and the first joint of both fingers and thumb much shorter than the others. It was the most extraordinarily shaped hand Mr Vance had ever seen, and he did not know in the least how to classify it. It repelled, yet interested him, and he eventually offered the man a good sum to allow him to keep it. To his astonishment, the man was the money was refused. You may have the thing and welcome, the fellow said, only I advise you do not look at it late at night, and just before getting into bed. If you do, you may have bad dreams. I'll take my chance of that, Mr Vance laughed. You see, being a hard-nosed cockney, I am not superstitious. It is only you Highlanders and your first cousins the Irish who believe nowadays in bogles, omens and such like, and packing the pan carefully in his knapsack, Mr Vance bid the strange-looking creature good morning and went on his way. For the rest of the day, the hand was uppermost in his thoughts. Nothing had ever fascinated him so much. He sat pondering the, over it the whole evening. At bedtime, found him still examining it. Examining it upstairs in his room by candlelight. He had a hazy recollection that some clock had struck twelve 
and he was beginning to feel that it was about time to retire when in the mirror opposite him he caught sight of the door. It was open. By Jove, that's odd, he said to himself. I could have swore I shut and bolted it. To make sure he turned around, the door was closed. An optical illusion, an optical delusion, he murmured. I will try again. He looked in the mirror. The door reflected and it was open. Utterly at a loss how to explain the phenomenon. He leaned forward in his seat to examine the glass carefully. And as he did so, he gave a start. On the threshold of the doorway was a shadow, black and bulbous. A cold shiver ran down Mr. Vance's spine, and just for a moment he felt afraid, terribly afraid, but he quickly composed himself. It was nothing but an illusion. There was no shadow there in reality. He had only to turn round and the thing would be gone. It was amusing, entertaining. He would wait and see what happened. The shadow moved. It moved slowly through the air like some huge spider or odd shaped bird. He would not acknowledge that there was anything sinister about it, only something droll, excruciatingly droll, yet it did not make him laugh. Then it had drawn a little nearer. He tried to diagnose it, to discover its material counterpart, one of the objects around him. But he was obliged to acknowledge his attempts were failures. There was nothing in the room at the least degree like it. A vague feeling of uneasiness gradually crept over him. Was the thing in the shadow something with which he was familiar, but could not just then recall to mind something he feared, something that was sinister? He struggled against the idea. He dismissed it as absurd, but it returned returned and took deeper root as the shadow drew nearer. He wished the house was not quite so silent, that he could hear some indication of life, anything, anything for companionship and to rid him of the oppressive, the very oppressive sense of loneliness and isolation. Again, a thrill of terror ran through him. Look here, he exclaimed aloud, Glad to hear the sound of his own voice. Look here, if this goes on much longer, I shall begin to think I am going mad. I have had enough, and more than enough, of magic mirrors for one night. It's high time I got into bed. He rose, strove to rose from his chair, to move. He was unable to do either. Some strange tyrannical force held him prisoner. A change now took place in the shadow. The blur dissipated and the clearly defined outlines of an object, an object that made Mr. Vance perfectly sick with apprehension, slowly disclosed themselves. His suspicions were verified. It was the hand, the hand no longer a skeleton but covered with green, mouldering flesh, feeling its way slyly and stealthily towards him, towards the back of his chair. He noted the murderous twitching of its short, flat fingertips, the monstrous muscles of its hideous thumb, and the great clumsy holes of its clammy palm. It closed upon him. Its cold, slimy, detestable skin touched his coat, his shoulder, his neck, his head. It pressed him down, squashed and suffocated him. He saw it all in the glass. And then an extraordinary thing happened. Mr. Van suddenly became animated. He got up and peeped furtively around. Chairs, beds, wardrobe had all disappeared. So had his bedroom. And he found himself in a small, bare, comfortless, queerly constructed apartment without a door. And with only a narrow slit of a window somewhere near the ceiling. He had in one of his hands a knife with a long, keen blade and his whole mind was bent on murder. Creeping stealthily forward, he approached the corner of the room, where he now saw for the first time a mattress, a mattress on which lay a huddled up form. What the thing was, whether human or animal, Mr. Vance did not know, did not care. All he felt was that it was there for him to kill.
that he wooed and he hated it. Hated it with such a hatred as nothing else could have produced. Tiptoeing gently up to it, he bent down and lifting the knife high above his head, plunged it into the thing's body with all the force he could command. He recrossed the room and found himself once more in his apartment at the inn. He looked for the skeleton hand. It was not where he'd left it. It had vanished. Then he glanced at the mirror and on its brilliantly polished surface saw not his face, but the face of the gardener, the man who had given them the hand. Features, colour, hair, all, all were identical, wonderfully, hideously identical, and as his, the eyes met his, they smiled devilishly. Early the next day, Mr. Vance set out for the spinney and cottage. They were not to be found. Nobody had ever heard of them. He continued his travels, and some months later, at a lone collection of pictures in a gallery in Edinburgh, he came to an abrupt, a very abrupt halt. Before the portrait of a gentleman in ancient costume, the face seemed strangely familiar. The huge head of thick red hair, the hawk-like features, the thin and tightly compressed lips, and then in a trice it all came back to him. The face he was looking at was that of the uncouth gardener, the man who had given him the hand. And to clinch the matter, the eyes leered.